Um, so Parent Network, we are somewhat in the office, somewhat still working from home, but if you need us, we are here. You email, call, reach out to us. Uh, we will be able to support you and your family through whatever means of contact you prefer. So please don't hesitate to reach out and ask for help if you need it. Uh, if you go to our website on our coronavirus um, section, we have the most recent and updated information from like New York State Department of Education, OPWDD, Department of Health, the CDC, links to other helpful resources such as things like education. And there's also a place to submit questions. So we have a lot of resources available if you need. Okay, just a little disclaimer to get us started. Uh, I'm not a medical provider. Parent Network of Western New York does not provide medical services. So any medical questions, comments, concerns that you have should be directed to your doctor, your child's pediatrician, someone that's a medical professional, and that is not me. So I am the Behavior Intervention Coordinator at Parent Network. So I am here to discuss um, tips, strategies about wearing masks, um, any behaviors associated with wearing masks and overcoming some of those barriers and challenges that you may be experiencing or may experience in the future. Okay. So here's our um, agenda for this morning. So we are just gonna go over some mask basics, just to make sure everybody has the basic information. We're gonna talk about some of the barriers in general that we're facing, and then we'll break it down into specific populations and tips for those specific populations. All right, so the mask, mask wearing basics. Um, when you think about who has to wear a mask, the CDC is saying everyone over the age of two, um, who is able to take off and put on their mask independently without assistance. So that is probably most of the population. Uh, where do we have to wear a mask? We have to wear it in public, um, when we're near other people, you know, when we can't maintain that social distancing, um, if you're with or near people that are known to have been exposed to COVID-19, or if you are with someone who has had a positive test result, if someone is displaying symptoms, it would be wise to wear a mask, or if you yourself um, are feeling symptomatic, have been exposed or have had a positive test result. Oops, back one. Um, and lastly, when and where do you not have to wear a mask? Um, you don't have to wear one when you're in your own home, generally speaking. Um, if you're outside of your home, in your own yard, on your own property, if you're outdoors um, at a park or things like that, but you're not near other people, then you don't necessarily have to wear a mask. And while you're actively eating and drinking, as long as you are maintaining that physical distance. So why do we have to wear masks? Um, every time a person coughs, sneezes, talks, laughs, breathes, we exhale little droplets or particles. Um, Everyone does it, but those different particles or droplets can land on surfaces or land on people or on our hand if we cover our face with our hand. And through those droplets, we can spread COVID-19. So if you are wearing a mask, it provides a level of protection between you and the people who might be touching those surfaces or people who are within a you know like six feet perimeter of you so COVID-19 can be spread even if you're not displaying symptoms so even if you feel fine you haven't been exposed or you think you haven't been exposed um you don't have a fever if you do indeed have the virus you can pass it to other people so wearing a mask protects us and protects those people around us so the correct way to wear a mask, um, a mask should cover your nose, your mouth, and go just a little bit underneath your chin. It'll hook around your ears, or some people like to kind of like tie around their head. Um, it should fit appropriately. You don't want a mask that is too large or too small. 
too large might be if you have like those gaps on the sides um like if your ear loops get stretched out it might get like a little droopy so you don't want it to fit like that but you also don't want something that's too restrictive um or too small um one of the ways that i have gauged if something's like too tight or too snug is if you breathe if the mask like goes in your mouth a little bit and then you can see it moving um or if you're talking and it's like going in your mouth a little bit that's probably not a well-fitted mask um and you want something again that the ear loops or however you're attaching it to your head you those need to be able to stay in place one of the barriers that i face i don't know i must have like funny shaped ears or something so when i hook a mask around my ears like my ears will fold down and it'll pop off um so i prefer the ones especially if it's for a longer period of time that have to you know tie around my head um you want to take off your mask and put it on and touch it by using the ear loops so if we have this the ideal way to put it on is to get on by the ear loops oh i just broke mine that's because i've done this a million times so um and then you pull down at the chin and then pinch at the nose and then take it off by the ear loops you do not generally speak want it below your nose or drooping hanging from your chin when you're not wearing it um because that defeats the purpose and then you have to touch it to pull it back up to your face and then you could risk contamination all right so a couple of do's and don'ts about masks just to highlight um do take off your mask to eat or drink as long as you're physically distant um store in a sealed container or a baggie if you have a washable mask that you're going to reuse so i have this cute little pattern here that someone made for me so if i am at work and i need to take it off for my lunch break i can put it in a little tupperware container or is it black baggie um you don't just want to like throw it down on a desk or something like that because again we want to keep it clean and sanitary to reduce the risk of infection any cloth masks um, should be washed regularly and dried before wearing you don't want to wear a wet mask um, wear your mask anytime you're in public or near other people and wash or sanitize your hands um, anytime you touch your mask so some of the don'ts do not share a used mask or a dirty mask do not touch your mask or the mask of others this is very important for kids especially i've seen some that have like superheroes and you know really cute things um and kids are interested and they're like oh look at that and then they touch it now we have to wash our hands uh don't use a wet dirty or soiled mask do not take off your mask when you're near other people do not wear your mask underneath your nose or hang it in, on your chin when not in use so just a couple of images about some of the types of masks that are being used. So we have the paper surgical masks. They come in boxes of, I don't know, 25, 50, stuff like that. You can get them most anywhere anymore. Um, these are considered disposable um, and not reusable. You can't launder them. This is an example of a homemade mask. um this is a gator some call it, people call it like a neck warmer or um a ski i think i heard someone call it like a ski scarf so it's just hollow um i have these because i wear them like as headbands um when i'm doing physical activity but it can also be used to cover your face because of the stretchy material um it doesn't offer as much protection so you could double it up if you wanted um but if you're doing like outdoor activities, this would probably be okay. Um, and then your standard uh, bandana, um, which you can fold up and look like, you know, you're playing robber for a day when you go to the store and just tie it around your face. Um, there are ways to make homemade masks out of bandanas and t-shirts and things like that. Um, there's a lot of YouTube tutorials out there for anyone who might want to check that out.
Um, the N95 mask is generally what um, medical professionals or people who are at risk of infection due to their jobs, thing, or their jobs or other circumstances. Um, I don't know anyone who has an N95 mask that is not a medical professional. So, so some of the barriers that I have been hearing about that people have been asking about. Um, include disinformation, um, people expressing their right to not wear a mask, medical health considerations, and emotional or mental health. So we're just going to break each one of these down a little bit. So when we look at disinformation, um, there is information out there saying that masks are not effective. So as per the most recent data from the CDC, I actually found an, an updated uh, research study that was published, I think it was August 7th, so I guess that's the most recent now, um, definitely shows that masks are effective in reducing the spread and the death rate from COVID-19. So you can definitely go to the CDC website and check out that research if you are interested. Um, do masks limit your ability to breathe or decrease your oxygen levels? So again, as per the American Lung Association, um, there is no limiting factors um, that would impale, sorry, not impale, impair your ability to breathe or decrease your oxygen levels. They did a study where they put those little blood oxygen things on people's fingers and had them wear different kinds of masks while doing different activities, and there was no change in someone's blood oxygen levels. Um, if you do have lung disease or other concerns, please talk to your doctor. Um, and do masks increase or decrease the risk of infection by COVID-19? So it does decrease. I could not find any evidence to say that it increases the risk of infection. Um, and again, it leads to lower death rates and this study was a collaboration with the CDC, the World Health Organization, and the University of California at San Francisco. So just a few of the facts about some of um, the information that you might be hearing. In terms of civil liberties, um, I just found some information about public health ordinances that have been put in place over you know, some of our lifetimes. Um, just to give some perspective, I'm not going to get political or argue either side of this. I'm just providing the facts. So because public health ordinances are usually started at a local or state level, um, it would be fairly abnormal to have a public health ordinance um, at the federal level over a short period of time, like six months, like we're experiencing now. So if we think about in New York State, um, like bans on smoking in public places. Um, those were started usually by businesses and maybe by your town or city or county. And then they went to the state level. And honestly, like, I don't even know if there is any federal law um, regarding like how far away you have to be from a building um, if you're smoking cigarettes. But those public health ordinances are put in place to protect the patrons and the employees of the businesses, of the indoor spaces, not to protect the person who is smoking cigarettes. So yes, you have a right to smoke cigarettes and you can do so as long as it's not potentially endangering the health and safety of others. Um, the same kind of thing with lead paint um, in New York State in the 1960s. Uh, there was a ban on lead paint for any new construction projects, new residential buildings, new apartment buildings. And then it wasn't until 1978 that there was a federal law pass, passed that banned the use of lead paint on all consumer-based products. So um, for the, those years between 1960 and 1978, it was just a local or state kind of ordinance on those new residential buildings. But as more information was learned about the dangers of lead paint, it eventually became a federal mandate. 
So, um, and I love this universal paradox. I use it a lot um, in my job as behavior specialist. Uh, you are free to choose, but you are not free from the consequences of your choice. So you do have the right to not wear a mask. Anyone has the right to not wear a mask, but the natural consequence of that might be that there's certain stores that won't let you enter their establishment. Um, you could receive, I don't know if this is happening at all, I haven't heard of it, you could receive a citation if you're not wearing a mask. Um, you could, you know, yourself become infected or potentially infect others. So you do have the right to choose not to wear a mask, but the natural consequences of that are, you know, maybe you can't go into the stores you want to go to, um, because they have the right to make those rules for their establishment to protect their customers and their employees. All right, physical and medical health. Um, if you think that you have a medical condition that could be impacted by wearing a mask, please talk to your doctor. Um, there was some fake little ADA cards going around um, that said that someone was exempt from wearing a mask because of a disability that they had. Um, those were not real. Um, the ADA doesn't give any kind of blanket immunity um, to any specific diagnoses or any classification of disabilities that makes you mask exempt. Um, and another study from the American Lung Association has shown that um, that masks have no detrimental effects, um, even in those patients who have chronic lung disease. So there is, again, there's no blanket medical condition or disability that just is carte blanche. Everybody with this diagnosis is mask exempt. It's on an individual basis based on each person's kind of unique situation. Um, the three exemptions that I did find were anyone who's able, not, or I'm sorry, unable to put on or take off a mask independently, um, small children under the age of two, or anyone actively having difficulty breathing. So if you have asthma and you're having an asthma attack, it is recommended that you take off your mask. Um, if someone has a serious medical issue and loses consciousness, um, they should take off their mask um, because they are now, if they're unconscious, they are physically not able to remove their mask without assistance. So those were the only types of exemptions that I could find. And again, nothing specific to a medical condition or a disability. Emotional and mental health. And this is where stuff gets a little tricky. Um, so the CDC does acknowledge that wearing a mask can pose some unique challenges um, for individuals with mental health or emotional health concerns. Um, for young children, for individuals with intellectual develop or developmental disabilities, and with sensory processing challenges. That being said, um, the exemption, a mask exemption may be given for someone who is experiencing significant distress or significant impairment or their mental or emotional health is being negatively impacted by wearing a mask. So someone, for example, who has post-traumatic stress disorder and um, cannot handle maybe something covering their face, someone who experiences paranoia or psychosis um, might feel people wearing a mask or themselves wearing a mask is suspect. Um, the sensory processing stuff we're going to get into in a lot more detail um, in a little bit, so we're going to skip over that for now. And again, if you believe that a mask is impacting your mental or emotional well-being, talk to your psychiatrist, talk to your counselor, talk to your doctor um, to get some advice from them. All right, questions about some of the barriers that we may face. All right, I'm just gonna keep on trucking along so we can get through this. 
So the first group of individuals that I want to talk about is small kiddos, like toddlers, um, elementary school age, um, and how to teach them to wear a mask if they're having a hard time. So the first thing we want to do is explain the rules and expectations in a very clear, concise, and consistent manner. Um, when I say consistent, if there's two parents in a household, we want to make sure both parents are on the same page and expressing the same rules and expectations so that it's clear to the child they're not getting one message from mom and another message from dad. Um, be clear about the rules. So if it's if your rule is every time we're out in public, whether we're indoors, outdoors, whatever the circumstance, that's when we need to wear a mask and you need to enforce those expectations. <clears throat> you can use social stories, which um, anybody who attends, I can email you a couple of the social stories that we have related to this. Um, visual aids, uh, different kinds of reminders, to help them understand what the expectations are. So once we know what the expectations are, let's start to expose our children to masks. So maybe store them in an area that is visible. Um, let the child, before you ask them to wear it, maybe for a whole day of school, let them interact with it, let them play with it, let them see what it feels like, let them put it on their toys and role play with it. Um, I have, like I said, the one mask that the ear loop just broke on, um, that's like my demonstration mask. It doesn't go anywhere, so I'm not worried about, you know, the way that I touch it, um, because I know it's not potentially contaminated because it doesn't leave this room. Um, so have the same thing for your kids so that they can just become more familiar with it, get used to it, see that it's not bad or scary. Um, because that is one thing that parents have expressed is that some kids are fearful. They see someone wearing a mask and they think that it looks scary or they think that because it covers their mouth and their nose that that would inhibit their ability to breathe, which makes sense for small child logic. Like you breathe through your nose, your nose and your mouth. So if something's now covering your nose and your mouth, how do you breathe? Okay, so by just testing it out, sampling it, wearing it around the house, um, they're gonna get used to it and they're gonna start to see that it doesn't impact their breathing. And then we want to model the mindset. So parents, older siblings, other people living in your house should be modeling the appropriate mask wearing rules for the smaller kiddos. Um, we also want to model appropriate language and language and attitudes towards masks so that we're not, not attaching a negative connotation to wearing a mask. So even though we all might feel at certain points, like this is annoying, my face is hot, oh, I forgot my mask, now I can't go here, this is stupid. We might have a lot of different feelings about it on any given day. We don't want to say those things out loud in front of our children because then they are going to pick up on the negative association with the mask and it's going to make it that much harder to get them to comply with the mask rule. So model the mindset. You have a mask, you're wearing the mask, it's okay to wear the mask, we're keeping everybody safe and healthy. Um, and if you have other negative kind of thoughts about it, express those when your child's not around. All right, um, narration is just a strategy that I use, um, again, in behavior intervention stuff, which is just narrating what you're doing, like talking yourself through the steps, but doing it out loud when you're in proximity to your child so that they can become familiar with maybe the different ways to store a mask or wash a mask or put a mask on and off. So again, with my broken ear loops here. So if I just took this out of the box, so I say, okay, I'm gonna sanitize my hands before I touch my mask. 
make sure I don't have any germs on my hands. All right, so my hands are sanitized. Now I'm gonna pick up my mask by my ear loop. I'm gonna hook it on my left ear, hook it on my right ear, pull it down over my chin and pinch it on my nose. All right, now I'm ready to go to the store. So you're just like telling a little story, narrating your own actions. You can do the same thing if you have reusable masks that need to be laundered. You can just say, okay, I'm collecting all the masks. I'm putting them in the washer so it gets rid of all the cooties. So you're just narrating what you're doing. And again, that's gonna help to expose your child to different aspects of mask, mask wearing. It's gonna become a whole lot less scary when kids start to realize that it gets washed just like their socks and underwear or anything else. Um, it becomes, you know, much more normalized and a whole lot less scary and intimidating. All right, next tip, helper tasks. Kids love to be helpers. They love to think that they're doing something that is contributing to the household, to reducing parent stress or things like that. So give them little tasks that they can do around wearing masks. So maybe it's their job if you're going on a family outing to the park to make sure, you know, they have enough masks and for everyone in the family and everybody has their own and they're clean and it's their job to count the paper masks and make sure they have enough. If you are washing your masks, um, maybe ask the kiddo to, you know, get their masks and physically put them inside the washing machine. Um, some people have been hang drying their masks. I don't know why. I think maybe they could shrink if they're like homemade ones. So if you're hang drying your masks, um, ask your kiddo to, you know, help you hang dry them. Um, if you're picking out fabric or material because you want to make your own masks, um, have your kids kind of engage in that process to the best of their ability, depending on their age. And then give tons of positive praise for the help that they're giving you. So you could just say, Debbie, that was so helpful. Thank you for hanging up those masks to dry. That really helped me out and I saved time. So now we can go play a game. Kids are gonna feel really good about that. All right, um, let children pick out their own masks. So if kids have buy-in and choice, they are more likely to comply with rules that they maybe don't necessarily like. Um, so regardless of what they pick out, you wanna make sure that it does fit right, like we talked about. Um, you can get kid size masks um, in a variety of different styles, whether it's um, homemade masks or cloth masks or um, the medical or paper mask. Um, there were some really cute ones I saw at Joanne Fabrics in like kid sizes. Um, or you can even let them decorate the mask. So if you're just using like the general mask like this, you know, have them put like a, you know, little stickers on the edge or, you know, put some beads on the ear loops. Like if the ear loops are too long, slide some pony beads on there and then like knot off the ends to make it a little shorter um because as long as it's dry you can use it so another thing that you could do is like you know when you dye easter eggs it's just like food coloring and water you could do the same thing with a mask and like dye it different colors just make sure it's 100 percent dry before you use it um so that way if they're like i hate blue um that you know then they can have a different color um so that's going to make kiddos feel more comfortable. Um, and if this is, if wearing a mask is something that is going to be kind of a long standing practice, which it kind of looks like it might be, it's going to be like a new accessory. And I've seen some pretty creative stuff out there already. So it's going to be the same as like, you know, picking out our own earrings or necklace or, you know, it's an accessory. So let's let them pick that out and you know kind of doll it up in any way that they see appropriate um as long as it doesn't inhibit the function of the mix okay and then we want to practice so have a practice mask have a couple of practice masks 
have it be the same kind of mask that you were going to ask them to wear at school or in the community. Um, and again, then you don't have to fear about it getting dirty or being contaminated because you know what's just in your house for practice. If they're very adverse to the mask and they're like, nope, don't want to do it, start slow and increase gradually. So maybe you try to have them put it on for like one minute. If they can't do a minute, make, try 30 seconds. Um, maybe make it into a game of some sort if they have siblings. Like, who can, you know, wear a mask for the longest? Or, um, you know, if you're playing a board game like Candyland or something, add a rule that every time you, you know, go up a ladder, you have to put on a mask. And when you go down a chute, you can take off your mask. Um, so add it into a game so you could just practice and make it fun. Um, if you're starting at home, slowly increase the time and frequency of wearing a mask. So if we start with one minute once a day, then maybe go five minutes twice a day. Um, but you want to do it again slowly and gradually based on what they're able to tolerate. And then the first time that you're going out, this might actually be on the next slide, that you're going out in the community, um, go to some place that is familiar, comfortable, um, that is easy to leave uh, in the event that your child has like a mask meltdown or is having a tantrum because they can't tolerate the mask any longer, um, or an outside place like, you know, the playground at the corner or something like that, um, so that if they can't do it for the amount of time you were hoping they could wear the mask for you have an easy out and you also don't have to worry about whatever behaviors might um come because they can no longer tolerate wearing the mask give um positive praise and use positive reinforcement anytime the kid does comply with the mask rules or even if they, you know, give a good faith effort in trying to wear the mask um, as expected. So, you know, if every time they wear it, they can earn a star on a sticker chart. And when they get X number of stars, you will take them out for an ice cream cone. Um, also, when you practice at home, do some kind of physical activity to help the kids see that, that the mask isn't um, hindering their ability to breathe. So do some jumping jacks, play a game of tag in the backyard, um, things like that, just so they can experience that. Okay, even when I start breathing a little heavier, it might feel different when I breathe, but I can still breathe. Um, we cover most of the wearing masks in public bit. Um, oh, but this is important. Have a bath backup mask. So Let's just say you take your kid to the playground, it's the first time they're wearing a mask in public and they're doing smashingly well and they're having fun and they're playing with other kids and they're keeping their mask on and everything's great. So like my mask where the ear loop just broke, gosh forbid you're at the park and your kid's having a really good time and following all the rules and then their ear loop breaks. Now they can no longer be at the park if they don't have a mask and you don't want them to feel like they're being punished or being bad or for something that ultimately wasn't their fault. So this way, if we have a backup mask, we can continue to enforce the expectations while also still letting the kiddo have fun under the circumstances. Fun is good. Fun is always good. Um, and they're not feeling like they're punished. Or if, you know, they take off their mask, if they're having a mask break, um, and they drop it in a mud puddle. Okay, kids drop things. Let's, you know, we have a backup. Here's your backup. Let's go play and have fun. Um, and then work in mask breaks for longer episodes of public mask wearing. So again, this is going to apply when kiddos are going to school. Um, a lot of the school plans do have mask breaks worked into it. So if you are somewhere where you can physically distance from other people and your child needs a mask break, again, just model the appropriate way to take the mask off, how to put the mask back on, 
how to store it if we're taking an extended mask break. Um, if you're out hiking and you're just taking it off for a couple of seconds, maybe to, you know, dab some sweat off your face because it's been very hot, that's different. You don't need to put it in a Ziploc baggie to um, dab sweat off your face. But if you're going to a restaurant, you're sitting down and you're eating a meal, I would recommend storing it appropriately because th there's many other people, there's the risk of con contamination. Um, make sure you wash your hands every time you touch your mask. So if they want a mask break, that's fine. Have some hand sanitizer so that they can sanitize after they touch their mask. <clears throat> okay, so a few of the challenges. Um, they're refusing, outright refusing, not doing it, not happening, won't wear a mask. Oh, sorry, I gotta let somebody in here. Okay. Um, make sure you enforce the rules and the consequences. Uh, it might be beneficial to review what the expectations are before you go on your outing and be prepared to know that if your child won't wear the mask that you might have to end the activity, the outing, the grocery shopping trip, whatever it might be. So if it's your first time um, and you're not sure how your child's going to respond in the grocery store with a mask, um, maybe start by getting, you know, what you need for dinner that night first. Um, so that if your child does start to have a tantrum or a meltdown, at least you have what you need. You can go through the checkout line and get out of the store. Um, if they're going to play with some friends at the playground or, you know, a backyard bounce house party, um, the natural consequence, if a child won't wear the mask under mm -hmm. circumstances um, in which they're in close proximity to other people, the natural consequence is then we can't stay at this event or activity, no matter how fun it is. So be mentally prepared to enforce those natural consequences because it's hard. It's absolutely hard because everybody wants their kids to have fun and be able to play with other children. Um, but at the same time, we need to enforce the rules and expectations because if we don't, then they're going to learn that the rules don't have any meaning, that the rules are things that we don't actually have to stick to. Um, and if your child's really struggling, revisit experiences when they were successful wearing a mask. So if there was a time previously where they went to the store or went to the playground or, um, you know, other days when they went to school and they had success and try to revisit those experiences and what led them to be successful on those days so that we can try to recreate those experiences. Another challenge um, that some parents have expressed to me is kids saying, well, why do I have to wear a mask? They're not wearing a mask, uh, which again, in little kid logic makes perfect sense. So let's continue to positively praise what they're doing well and the rules that they are following. Um, and then there's two approaches. You could either educate your child um, with simple and appropriate language about the fact that maybe not everyone can wear a mask and we don't know someone's reasons for not wearing a mask. Um, and then there's the, you know, let's mind our own business approach, which is, you know, we can only do what we can do. We don't know what they're doing. So let's just mind our own business and do what we need to do. Um, if we're talking about, you know, kids with special needs, it might be important for them to understand, to, to develop some of that empathy and perspective taking um, that maybe some of their classmates aren't physically able to tolerate a mask or to put a mask on and it's up to the rest of us to wear our mask to help keep them safe because they can't wear the mask for whatever reasons. Um, <clears throat> and encourage uh, the kids to be like a good ro role model and set a good example for other kids. So I know older siblings, you know, our, my sister was always told um, to set like a good example and be a good role model for me. 
Um, so the reverse can also be true. If you have a little orchid, that is 100% okay with a mask. Um, there's no reason why they also can't try to set a good example um, for their peers or for their siblings. All right, teens and tweens. Um, you're going to see a little bit of repetition here. So we want to talk about the rules and expectations, be clear, concise, and consistent. Um, depending on the kid's age, developmental level, chronological age, um, if they have a developmental or intellectual impairment or not, um, you're going to have to adjust your approaches a little bit and we will get specifically into some strategies for um, individuals who may have an intellectual or developmental disability. But for the rest of us, um, or the neurotypical kids, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we want to explain those rules, expectations, we want to enforce them, we want to consider to model the mindset, Teens and tweens, um, you know, pick up on this in a different way than toddlers and young children do. Um, it might be a little more of a snotty way um, where they kind of throw it back at their parents like, well, you didn't do it, so I'm not gonna, and you can't make me kind of idea. So let's remember that these kiddos are, you know, following the example that is set for them. Um, Using positive reinforcement can also be very helpful for teens and tweens, but we have to make sure that the reinforcer is something that's motivating and meaningful to the child or to the teen tween. Um, so a teenager might not be very motivated to like earn a sticker on a chart um, with the hopes of earning an ice cream cone at the end of the week but they might be more motivated by earning extra screen time or being able to stay up past bedtime or being able to go out and, you know, ride bikes independently with their friend in the community because they've demonstrated an ability to adhere to the mask rules or other things, you know, maybe there's a new video game that they want and that's something that they can work towards as long as, you know, they're complying with wearing their mask as appropriate. Um, again, all kids, all teens, all tweens are different. Maybe they collect stickers, they really like stickers, maybe there's something else they want to earn. So just think about what is motivating and meaningful to um, your kid, your teen, your tween. Um, when you're setting up a positive reinforcement system. So because um, teens and tweens have a level of independence that toddlers and young children don't, um, we have to hopefully teach them good judgment and good practice to follow the rules because once they're at school or not under adult supervision, we want them to make the right decisions about wearing a mask because it's not very likely that um, an adult providing supervision is going to be following them around everywhere that they go um, to make sure they're following the mask rules. So talk to um, tweens and teens about social responsibility, um, causes, and things that are important to them. So if we're talking about um, gun violence in schools or just in communities in general or climate change, so these are things that young people, generally speaking, are passionate about and they might do school assignments or projects or different activities because of their desire to make changes um, on some of these issues. So talk to them about social responsibility in terms of masks as well. So we know that things like climate change, that what we individually do 
can impact everyone else and the planet. So what we do and our actions are surrounding wearing a mask does have an impact on the people around us and on our community. So, you know, find those types of um, issues that your teen or tween might be, you know, passionate about and relate mask wearing to those experiences because we're talking about the good of the many and how one person's um, actions and behaviors affect others and how the actions of others um, impact us individually. Um, also, I think it's important to um, address situations in which maybe their peers um, are not wearing masks, not following the rules for whatever reasons. Um, I've seen plenty of videos online where people are, I don't know what to call it, mask shamed in a grocery store or other public venue. And that does not appear to be an appropriate way to get people to comply with wearing a mask. I think it just makes everybody really mad. Um, so are there ways that they can use their voice and their dedication to social responsibility to, you know, talk appropriately to peers who maybe not, might not be wearing a mask? Um, are there situations in which your teen or tween um, would be in a situation where maybe people aren't practicing safe mitigation strategies. Maybe there's a whole big group of people and nobody's wearing a mask. And how is your kid, if they don't feel safe and they don't feel comfortable, how can they get themselves out of that situation um, in a way that they're okay with? Um, kids might get embarrassed easily and we would rather have them try to remove themselves from a situation in which they feel unsafe rather than staying in that situation and maybe giving into some negative peer pressure and taking off a mask and engaging with their peers in a setting that's not safe. So let's make a plan for how we're gonna address those situations should our tweens and teens find themselves in those situations so that they can have their own sense of self, they can maintain self-respect and dignity, but they can also um, stand up to or not succumb to negative peer pressure based on other people's um, bad behavior and not wearing a mask. Um, oh, and then review, like, what are the expectations? Like, are you letting your kid go to small peer gatherings? Um, with the expectation that everybody's going to remain outside, we're going to, you know, as much as humanly possible, maintain a safe distance, and everybody's going to wear their mask, or are we going to a pool party with a hundred people, you know, in a small pool, in a small backyard, um, and there aren't any masks required. Um, if your child knows what the expectations are, um, are they having those conversations with their friends beforehand, um, before they go to the party or the event to make sure that it is a place that they're going to feel safe, protected, and that they can be successful in socializing and um, following the mitigation strategies. So I feel like there's a lot of peer pressure in that isn't always necessarily bad. You can use peer pressure in a good way, especially if you are the person who is adhering to the mitigation strategies and using that voice to help others to um, comply with the rules. All right, some of the challenges with teens or tweens. Um, calls from school, I this is something I anticipate happening or that parents have said like, oh, well, what if the school is sending them home because they're not wearing a mask, okay? Um, so I guess we don't really know until school starts, which is very soon. Um, but reinforce and review with your kid maybe what the rules are for wearing a mask at school and on the bus. So again, so they know in advance, they know what to expect. 
um, encourage the rule compliance at the school and the consequences, um, again, that are meaningful and motivated. Um, so if they are not following the rules at school um, while they're interacting with their peers in the hallway, then maybe a natural consequence to that would be if you can't be responsible in school when you're engaging in social interaction, then it you probably can't be responsible outside of school having social interaction. So we're not doing that anymore. If you want to have friends over here where you can be supervised um, and make sure everybody's following the rules, you know, you can invite a friend over here, but we're not going to friends' houses until you can prove that you can be responsible with your mask wearing. Um, the school might. And I don't know if this was a thing, but maybe they say like, well, until you can comply with the masks, you can only do distance learning. You can't do in-person learning. That might be a motivation to not wear a mask for some. And for other people, it might be a motivation to wear a mask, depending on if they like physically going to school. Um, if they're not complying with a mask on the bus, maybe they have to have their parents drive them to school. Um, and if the school gives consequences, um, you know, support the teachers or administrators that are giving those consequences and make your teen or tween kind of stick to those consequences. I don't know what those things might look like, um, but I know that with this upcoming school year, it's new for all the teachers and administrators as well. So, if they're breaking the rules at school, the school's going to give consequences and for consistency. Um, I think it's important to have everyone follow through on those consequences that the school's given, as long as it's reasonable. Um, and again, we talked about if they're not being compliant during community outings or social interactions, maybe you have to say, well, that's only going to happen under my supervision or Maybe it's only, you know, you can't go to friends' houses, but you can meet them at parks where, you know, people are outside and there's less potential of um, contamination, infection, spreading the illness. Um, maybe they can only have social interactions if we, you know, know that a parent, whether it's um, us or someone else's parent, can provide supervision. Generally speaking, teens and tweens don't like this. They like their independence and their time. So hopefully that will um, convince them to follow the rules because it's not worth having mom watching us. All right, some special um, populations. Um, so people with intellectual or developmental disabilities. So let's think about, you know, what this person's level of understanding um, intellect and cognition is and adjust any of the strategies and tips that we've already talked about to be appropriate for them. Um, so when we're talking about the rules and expectations, we still want to be, <clears throat> excuse me, clear, concise, and consistent. We're doing that across the board. Um, but maybe we need to adjust our language so that it's more easily understood um for the individual's developmental level maybe we want to um illustrate or uh reinforce the words that we're saying by using pictures images visual aids um to help the kiddo understand what those rules are um maybe we consider altering the rules and expectations a little bit based on someone's level of functioning and understanding um some things can be a little confusing like you have to wear a mask when you're in public when you can't maintain social distancing but if you're outside and you're socially distanced even though you're in public you don't or you might be able to take off your mask in those situations maybe just think about a blanket every time we're outside of our own home or property we're wearing a mask bottom line because that's going to be more simple more concrete um and less like situational where you have to gauge like how far away is this person. Um, so it might just be easier to have like a blanket rule if we're not at home, we're wearing a mask at the end. Um, they might need more breaks when 
wearing a mask for an extended period of time than maybe a neurotypical child. Um, if you have service providers um, where someone's going to receive a service someplace um, or if there are specific rules that are set up at the school, find out what those rules are either with the service provider or at the school and maybe try to have those same rules at home or let the school or service provider know what rules you have at home to see if they can mirror the same rules in the educational setting or with the service provider because the consistency will be helpful in maintaining compliance and helping the child to understand but if they have one set of rules when they go to respite and another set of rules when they're at school and then a third set of rules when they're at home you know or if they have you know spend part-time with mom and other part-time at dad if we have parents who are not living together now they have four sets of rules and that can be very confusing and very overwhelming and if they're not understanding like the differences between all the rules then they don't know what to do at school but they were just at mom's house and then remember what the rules are there but now they're not following the same rules at school it's confusing it's going to lead to some possible uh, challenging behaviors that we'd rather not experience so if we can find a way to standardize some of the rules, maybe not all of them, but some of those expectations, um, it's gonna be a lot easier for these types of kiddos to catch on and understand and comply with that. Um, so these individuals might not be able to make their own kind of adjustments based on fit, and comfort level of the mask so it's going to be up to the parents and caregivers to you know make sure it fits in all the ways that we have talked about um and that it's comfortable if you know your child's coming home from school and they have like indents on their nose because the nose piece is like so snug or pinched so hard you know um if they can't appropriately put the right amount of pressure on the nose piece maybe we need to consider something that has a fixed nose piece or no metal bendable nose piece, things like that. Um, consider types of masks that might be better for them based on their own individual and unique needs. Um, and make sure that they're able to take it off um, without assistance. Maybe have them demonstrate that they can do it um, before like sending them off to school because gosh forbid there's some kind of medical emergency um, and they need to remove it um, and they can't. So something like um, a gator, um, like this, you have to put on and off over your head. So I don't know what might like if you were choking let's say like you might not want something hanging around your neck you'd want to pull it off or even if you were coughing a lot or um getting overheated and you need to take it off for a little bit um make sure they can you know reach to the back and pull it off over their head without assistance so that they can adjust their own comfort level as needed um we're gonna get into kind of gradual exposure and desensitization when we talk about sensory processing, but start small and increase slowly. And we'll break down what that looks like in more detail. Um, when you practice, um, do role plays, put it on the stuffed animals or the teddy bears or the toys. Um, practice with people that are familiar and places that are familiar for maximum comfort level. And again, give those mask breaks. All right, sensory process. Um, individuals who have sensory processing differences might have an aversion to wearing a mask because of the physical feeling of the mask on their face. It could be a certain component of the mask. Maybe it's the ear loops or the elastic. Maybe it's the metal nose piece. Maybe it's the feeling of the material on the skin. Um, I know I've worked with a lot of kids diagnosed with autism who hate like tags on clothing because it has like an itchy feel. So we think of that in the same kind of way. Maybe that's how these individuals might feel about a mask. Um, 
So if your child's able to identify if there's a specific component of the mask that they don't like or that is more uncomfortable, then is there a way we can make some kind of adjustment to the mask or try a different kind of mask? So this isn't really a sensory processing thing, but some of the barriers that I've found with masks is um, like the homemade masks that have the seam in the middle nose piece right here. Um, I like them, they're cute, there's different designs, but I have a bifocal in my glasses. So if my glasses sit right on the edge of that metal nose piece, it raises my glasses up just a smidge, but now the line of the bifocal goes right through my direct line of sight and it's kind of nauseating. Um, so for those reasons, depending on what I'm doing, I might like a paper mask better. Um, whereas if I um, can wear a little lower on my nose so it doesn't sit on my glasses, depending on what I'm doing, um, then maybe those are circumstances under which I can wear that type of mask. Um, ones that tie around your head or have elastic um, that goes around your head can pull on your hair, or there have been many times when I was tying something behind my head and you accidentally tie your hair up in it. Um, those things might be uncomfortable. So maybe if you have stuff that ties or is elastic around the head, maybe you need to consider switching to something with ear loops. Um, one of the things I don't like about the ear loops is being someone who wears glasses. Um, sometimes if I try to take off my mask, it gets caught up on my glasses and then I pull it off by the ear loop and then my glasses also come off. So that could pose unique challenges. So there's all these different things. Um, that maybe we don't think about on a regular basis, but in you know 2020, there are things that we have to start thinking about a little bit more. So is there a different kind of mask or an adjustment we can make to a mask to make it more sensory appealing um, to these individuals? Um, I was gonna say something, I lost my train of thought. So, um, Yeah, sorry, don't remember, it's just gone. So when we talk about desensitizing and gradual exposure, um, if kids are extremely averse to, um, to a particular item, object, masks, um, we wanna start slowly, more slowly than we would with other kids. So maybe we just start by looking at pictures. Um, you know, maybe we pull up um, an Etsy page that has a bunch of different kinds of masks and we just sit there with our kiddo and look at different pictures of masks. Maybe you print out some pictures or have a catalog with masks and just flip through and look at the pictures. Um, if your child can tolerate looking at pictures, then maybe we try to touch the pictures. Um, or we try to have the pictures in general proximity. Maybe they're okay as long as mom's holding the catalog and the kids sit next to them and just looking at the pictures, but the child is unable or unwilling to hold the catalog of all the different mask styles and flip through it. So let's try touching the pictures. Um, Try putting the pictures near or in proximity to the child when they're engaging in a preferred activity. So if they love playing Legos, um, how does the kid respond if we just sit the, the mask catalog um, next to them while they're playing Legos? Do they pick up the catalog and throw it? Do they run away because they don't wanna be anywhere near the mask, um, even though it's just pictures? So we want to start this very gradual exposure and we don't want to increase the level of exposure until we have been able to tolerate the current level. So if your child is not yet able to look at images of a mask without having a meltdown or running away or having some other kind of behavioral challenge, then they're not yet ready to move on to the next stage. So we want to slowly and gradually increase our exposure. If they're able to tolerate it in the room, you know, how close can we move it to them so they can't tolerate it? Let's scatter some masks around the house. We have some in the living room. We have one sitting on their Xbox controller that they have to move out of the way if they want to play their Xbox. 
It's sitting on the dining room table while we're eating. So all these different things to slowly expose. Um, once they get to a point where they've just mastered being in proximity to the mask, maybe we can have them hold on to, the, to it while they're, we're having family movie night or something. So this way, again, they're just getting used to it. Um, they're getting used to the way it feels, to the material. So it's just holding on to it. Once they're able to hold on to it, maybe the next step is seeing how it feels on different parts. So how does it feel on our arm? How does it feel on our cheek? And just, again, very slowly, very gradually um, exposing um, and increasing over time. So once we get to the point where there's nothing else we can do other than putting the mask on, let's say we can get your child to put the mask on, um, maybe it only lasts for a second. And then they take it off. Okay, well, when we first started, they couldn't even be in the room with a picture of a mask, and now they're at least trying to put it on. So that's, that's progress. Um, this is a long, drawn-out process. It can be very slow. Um, so if you're just getting started and you're hoping to be ready by September 10th, might not happen. Um, let the teachers in the school know where you're at. Um, maybe they have some tips. Maybe they have ways they can help you out. Maybe they can reinforce um, some of what you're doing um, to help gain that compliance. Um, and then, you know, once you get up to maybe 10 seconds, do 10 seconds twice a day, 10 seconds three times a day, then try to go to 15 seconds. <coughs> Again, very short, very gradual, slowly increasing, um, offer lots of breaks and give praise and reinforcement as many times as humanly possible for every little success. We wear it for one second, that's awesome. We wanna give positive praise, wear it for two seconds, give double the positive praise um, and encourage our kids to continue what they're doing even though it's slow, um, that they are making progress and we can see that they're making the effort. Um, we have a comment or question here. Um, I'm gonna read it out loud, April. It says, my child has, I think it's severe autism. He's 10, he's in a 613 class, limited verbal skills, um, does not have any reasoning skills. I've tried different masks, done it on the stuffed animals, modeled. I had him make one and glue a picture of himself for the visual, visual aids um he rips off mom's mask oh um he will hold it up to his face for seven seconds he screams and pulls it away that's as far as you've been able to get any suggestions um that's definitely tough and seven seconds it sounds like you have worked very hard for those seven seconds the fact that you know that it's exactly seven seconds um means that you are very going very slowly and timing it um is let's mm, here For his school, is it an expectation that he will be able to wear a mask in order, or do they expect him to wear a mask to be able to attend school in person? No, okay. I was gonna say, because he sounds like he might fall into one of those um, categories of someone who, again, not a blanket mask exemption, but it sounds like he might not be able to wear a mask. And I, I actually have a slide coming up, but we can talk about it now. Um, when we have individuals who have such um, significant behavioral concerns or levels of cognitive or intellectual impairment um, that they can't fully or even partially comprehend things about wearing a mask. Um, so if you have a child who um, every time you try to get them to wear a mask, they're kicking, spitting, biting, running into traffic, stuff like that, um, those types of behaviors are 
significant enough that the behaviors are putting them, the child more at risk than the possibility of being infected um, from coronavirus. So if you weigh the, you know, risk and reward, if the behaviors are causing more potential for risk, um, then it doesn't, it's not logical to expect them to wear a mask. Um, also, if someone is impaired cognitively or intellectually to a degree that they don't understand or comprehend that why they have to wear it, um, and I'm not saying like understanding the science of, you know, microscopic droplets and stuff like that, but just we wear this so it keeps us safe, it keeps other people safe. Um, you know, we wear it in public, but not at home. If some of those most basic things they can't comprehend, then in my mind, they don't meet that very basic criteria of someone who can put on and take off a mask without assistance. If they can't refrain from touching someone else's mask and try to take someone else's mask off, or if they don't understand social distancing, then they might take it off, put it on, take it off, put it on, take it off, put it on, and now they're just increasing the risk of infection to themselves because they're not able to wear the mask appropriately and take it on and off without assistance. So maybe the assistance that they need um, is understanding about using it appropriately and washing and sanitizing their hands and all those things, but it's still, they're not able to do it independently. So in my mind, that meets that most basic criteria that you need to be able to do it independently or not do it. Um, I, I hear what you're saying that you can't go anywhere. Do you mean you can't go to like stores and things like that um, because of your child's inability to wear a mask? Okay, uh, how old is he? Or she, wait, did you say he? Yeah. 10. Do, have people refused to let you in to the store or asked you to leave? Or do you just make the assumption that because a store has a mask rule that um, if he's not wearing one, you can't enter? Okay, you haven't tried due to the rules. Um, there are some individuals that I work with um, who have extremely significant behavioral concerns and are, you know, pretty significantly um, cognitively or intellectually impaired. And one family, I did tell them that, like, because of the degree of risk and reward. Um, and the behaviors they were experiencing, like, you know, people were getting punched and stuff like that, um, that we just talked about, like, not trying to force wearing a mask. If at some point, someday, the child is like, yep, I want to do this, um, by all means, like, yay, get on board with that. Um, but they just stopped trying because it wasn't worth it, and they have gone, um, to some places and haven't had any problems. Um, I don't know if you can talk to um, doctor or pediatrician. Um, I don't think they're gonna like write you, I don't know, maybe they would like write a doctor's note um, or something like that. So if someone did try to give you a hard time at the store, um, because again, your son appears to kind of fit that criteria of, you know, he is not physically able to do it independently. Um, and therefore he shouldn't be forced to wear it. Um, you know, that's why it's important for all of us who can follow the mask rules to do so. Um, because there are people out there who can't and, you know, that's where the social responsibility comes in. I can help to keep your son safe because I can wear a mask.
So, and if you're ever not sure, um, you could always, I don't know if you want to go to Walmart or something, um, you could call in advance and just say, hey, you know, I have a 10 year old son. He's diagnosed with autism. He's having a really, really hard time with this mask stuff. Um, he's not able to tolerate it. Um, but we need to come to your store to, you know, get school supplies. You know, is that going to be a problem? Um, I don't know what they would say, but it could be worth trying that. And I haven't noticed many people bringing stuff up to kids in public. Usually, um, if someone's given anybody a hard time, it's the adults. So... And maybe if you go to the store and he sees everybody doing it, maybe he would want to too. I don't know. But those, but yeah, if, if you're getting like significant behavioral concerns related to the mask, it might be time to, you know, give it a break for now and um, revisit it in the future if he decides he wants to try again. So I know that's not the best answer because I don't want to encourage anyone just giving up. Um, but we don't want anyone, you know, to get sick or injured or, you know, have meltdowns or tantrums or cause a level of, an, of emotional distress um, that is harmful. Yeah, eventually he will need to leave the home. And I would just try to take him. And just again, kind of like when he talked about the first time, maybe you take your child to a grocery store, like maybe plan for, okay, if this goes sideways or if they tell us we can't come in or um, if we're there for X amount of time and it's just not going well in general, like, have have an escape plan have a way to end that shopping trip or maybe just try something like you know going to a very small store like a 7-eleven or something where you're just grabbing like one or two things and then leaving um and seeing how other people in your community respond um i would think hopefully if people are decent that you know he's a kid he's 10 um hopefully they will won't be giving anybody too much grief over that Um, all right, so I think we talked about sensory processing. All right. Um, individuals with um hearing and speech impairments, um, again, not necessarily exempt from wearing a mask. Um, so there are some specialized types of masks that um, people can wear to accommodate this population. You can see the lady here um, with the clear um, window on her mask. Um, I think someone told me it was, was it Clarence School District is um, providing uh, masks like this with the clear window um, to all their teachers, which is pretty awesome, I think. Um, so individuals who have, uh, who are hard of hearing or deaf, they might ask someone else to remove their mask if they need to see your mouth um, to read your lips and to know what you're saying. So to me, that's a reasonable request. Um, maybe we want to make sure we're distance, you know, go into a place where there's not a lot of other people we can take off our mask. Remember, we're taking it off with our ear loops. We're not hanging it from our chin um, so that you can have the conversation with that person. And then you can put your mask back on. If you need to take theirs off, they can put their mask back on. Um, so if they, again, if you don't have the kind with the little clear window, um, an example of this might be um, if you are at a restaurant um, and you need to com communicate, you know, uh, the waitress asks like, what kind of cheese do you want on your burger? Um, the, the individual with the hearing impairment might need to ask the waitress or someone might need to ask on their behalf um, to take the mask off so they can read the lips and answer the question. Um, there's also in the bottom left here, the face shields. 
um, my understanding is this is what a lot of like speech therapists will be using. Um, if you're teaching speech, it's understandable that people would need to see your mouth. Um, the, a face shield in general doesn't provide the same level of protection as a mask because you have all this space where you can, you know, breathe in things that are in the air. Um, but for the purposes of teaching things like speech or I'm trying to think of other possible situations in which this might arise, but we'll just stick with speech for now. Um, during the speech therapy session, they would take off the mask and have the shield. Um, the CDC is saying that a shield should, you know, curve around the sides of your face, hang below your chin. Um, not recommended for babies, newborns, infants. Um, if you are not socially distanced, um, so like maybe when the speech teacher is walking from one classroom to another, they should be also wearing a mask um, or wearing a mask instead to um, provide safety through breathing in those droplets. Um, but this is, again, an option to provide some level of protection um, when people um, have hearing or speech impairments and they need to see um, the face, the mouth, the tongue. Um, doctors are also wear, wear face shields, but that's to, you know, stop things from physically hitting their person. Um, face shields do also protect your eyes, which masks do not. Um, but I don't know how many people are uh, getting droplets in their eyes, but you know, if you're concerned about that, you could wear a face shield. Um, okay, the significant cognitive impairments. Oh, also, I like this picture. This is some of that creativity we talked about where it looks like a dressy scarf, but it's also a mask. I like that. Um, so individuals that have significant cognitive impairments, um, they are there's the possibility that they don't have the capacity to comprehend the expectation again they're not explicitly exempt um and you know maybe they're not wearing a mask in public um maybe they take it off and put it on without notice or when they're in close proximity of others maybe they're nonverbal and unable to speak so if you're asking them or telling them to wear a mask and you're not getting a response maybe that's because they can't respond. Um, you know, they might be have, have a person providing um, supervision, a parent, caregiver, staff person. So if you have, you know, if there's any concerns about wearing a mask um, or, you know, being in public, being in the store, um, you might need to re redirect those questions to the person providing supervision because they would be able to explain or give an explanation about why someone can't um, wear a mask. Um, but like, like I uh, shared earlier with April, that again, if someone doesn't understand the expectations, then can they really wear the mask independently and without assistance? And, and I would say no because if they need the, the cognitive assistance, then they can't do it independent. Um, and again, I don't know because I'm not a doctor or a medical professional. I don't know what medical professionals are recommending for these individuals in terms of being able to go into public places and schools and parks and grocery stores. Um, I think that especially if we're talking about smaller kids that I think you take them, they're under parent supervision. Um, I think it would be more concerning for um, adults with these significant impairments because they might not have someone to speak up for them and advocate for them. Um, and they, there's a possibility that they appear like they have the ability and capacity to wear a mask when maybe they don't. Um, and the significant behavior challenges, which we talked about some of those already. Um, but for the sake of this presentation, I am 
using the term significant behavior challenges to talk about those behaviors that potentially put um, the individual or other people at risk um, or in harm's way. So if we're talking scratching, biting, kicking, head banging, head butting, eloping, running away, um, absconding, whichever word you want to use. Um, again, if the behavior um, is presenting more of a risk of harm than the possibility of you know, being exposed to COVID-19, then it's probably not worth it to try to enforce mask rules and expectations. Um, if the individual has, has some type of behavior plan when they're in school, um, do we need to think about amending the behavior plan <clears throat> to reflect their mask needs? Um, is there something a, the behavior specialist at the school can do to help support in the home and in the community or some different strategies that they can try? Um, again, in a community-based setting, if the risk of harm of trying to enforce the rules is putting people at risk, then that's a situation in which we probably just don't enforce the mask rules. And it's up to the rest of us to be socially responsible um, to keep those individuals safe um, because they don't have the capacity to wear a mask. Um, lastly, um, individuals that have limited movement or physical disability, um, someone who maybe um, it doesn't only has one arm, someone who has CP and maybe can't get both arms up to their head or around their head to um, hook on their ears or tie something around their head. Um, so there are some pretty unique ways out there that I've discovered online um, to accommodate these individuals. Um, <clears throat> if they want to, um, you know, make those adjustments so that they can wear a mask. So we can see this woman in the picture here, she has some Velcro on her mask. So if she can get it to here, if she can, you know, if she can reach just near her face, then she can, you know, stick the Velcro on there and wear her mask. Um, snaps might have the same kind of benefit. Um, magnets could also work. Um, there are also, if you have, um, if you can tie in the front like a bandana, if you can tie in the front and then you can just turn it around if you can't get both arms behind your head or behind your ears. Um, if there's something that can be pre-tied that someone can just slide on over their head or wear like a gaiter. Um, but again, if, it's not able to be worn appropriately or independently, then that person might be exempt from having to wear a mask. Um, even if they, someone might technically be exempt, they might still want to wear a mask because they want to keep them sa themselves and others um, safe and healthy. So um, using some of these, I don't wanna know, uh, adjustments, um, accommodations, I don't know, um, tweaks to the way that, uh, you know, the style of the mask are definitely um, an option for some of these individuals. So just to review all this stuff that we talked about, um, a few bullet points, everyone over the age two who's able to wear a mask independently should be doing so, doing it anytime you're not at home, practice with your kiddos, Start slowly and continue gradually. Make sure the mask fits correctly and comfortably. Um, any questions about medical, mental health, emotional health, direct to the appropriate medical professional. And this is all to protect ourselves and others from the spread of COVID-19. And here's a couple of little quotes from some of that most recent research um, from the Journal of American Medicine. Medical Association and the CDC. 